Hello. Hi, is this Ted? Yes, Tiffany. Hi, yes, this is Tiffany and Terry from Crag Life. How are you? I'm great. How are you guys doing? We're good. We're good. Well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we have, <laughs> we have been talking about the film for the past a little bit over a half hour we've been talking about the man who we're speaking to right now and we are so very excited and honored to welcome the oh, one and only Mr. Mike. Ted Neely you're on the air with Terry and Tiffany welcome <laughs> oh, thank you so very much that makes me feel great well I'm the biggest fan ever I, I must profess that you got me in so much trouble once upon a time <laughs> oh I want details at, <laughs> at the time the film came out and the soundtrack came out I was going to school, and the school happened to be a Christian school. And, of course, all the kids wanted the soundtrack tapes, the cassettes, okay, because cassettes were big back in the day. And anybody that had the soundtrack of Jesus Christ Superstar, they would be confiscated by the principal. Really? So we got in big trouble because they would take them and we would buy them again. And they would take them and we would buy them again. So we kind of contributed to your sales. Of, uh, Man, I, well, I got to tell you, there was this enormous boost back a few years back that had to be you. My goodness. It was. And, and I'm telling you, yes. uh, being in a Christian school, you know how kids are. I mean, they're brought up in a Christian home or whatever. But, you know, you got to do math and history, but then you had to do Bible study. It's like, oh, i got to do the Bible study. But actually, Jesus Christ Superstar made us want to do our Bible study, made us want to do that part of our schooling of learning about the Bible. That is incredible. My goodness. And, and then did you get punished for, uh, you know, continually replacing that which was taken away from you? <laughs> well, l luckily it wasn't a Catholic school where we'd have got the stick. It had it, been like when Jesus got beat. But... Did, did they ever stop at 39? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted... This is incredible. I'm sorry you had to go through that. But I'm really proud you had the courage to give it a shot. Well, that's all right, because it, it was worth it. And we just love the music, and I've been loving doing the history, because we certainly want to talk about the anniversary of Jesus Christ Superstar. But we want to go into uh, Ted Neely, B.C., Ted Neely before Christ, uh, talking about things. Well, that, uh, that, that, that's a bit of a challenge to the memory, you know. I mean, I, I can go <laughs> back to 1,500 years, but anything beyond, you know, that, those 2,000 <laughs> years, it's a little cloudy if you get my drift. Well, uh, we wanted to talk. Uh, well, first of all, like, like we said, congratulations on the 46th anniversary. That's amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank uh, you. But let's talk about where Ted Neely started out. I mean, you're from a little town in Texas, right? So, yes. so how did you get the the singing slash musician slash acting bug? How did this all start, Ted? How did this start in Texas? Honestly, it started. Uh, so I was told by my parents the the day I was born, because they said that uh, the minute that I breathed my first breath, and then at that period I don't know how they do it now, but then you know they would pick the baby up by the ankles and give him a pat on the rear end, and mm -hmm. the baby would cry. Right. And uh, so they patted me, and apparently I went, yeah! <laughs> so there was a, a chance for me to do something from then on. <laughs> and I'm being obviously facetious here, but uh, both my parents uh, were beautiful singers. They weren't professional. We just, we just did it at home every night. When my dad would come home from work, he'd get out his guitar or ukulele, and my brother and sister and mom and dad and I would sing, just sit there and sing. And we learned how to harmonize with songs before we could speak the language even, you know? And uh, that was nurtured with us uh, all through our teenage years. And I, when I was uh, nine years old, I was hanging out with a group of boys and we were, you know, thinking, dreaming of having our automobile club, you know, the car club boys mm -hmm. in Ranger, Texas, you know, and we'd meet once a week. And one of those meetings, one of the guys brought a guitar and uh, wow. we started singing. And so the next thing you know, we're singing for school socials and church socials and every other kind of social. Uh, you know, we were the only band in town, so of course we got hired for everything. Oh, sure. Uh, so we, we became a copy band. We could sing anything we could, you would hear on the radio. In fact, where we would play, they'd call us a weekend human jukebox because we'd play <laughs> like the people who sang the song. 
Right. So I did that all through my school years. And when we graduated from high school, we literally, instead of playing for our graduation, we drove to Abilene, Texas and played for theirs. And then the summer was coming and our parents agreed to let us go wherever we wanted to go for that summer and come back to Texas in the fall and go to Texas University. And uh, we headed west and ended up in California. And uh, we didn't make it back for that uh, mm. University start. We well, were very fortunate. Yeah, because you, you, you know, actually, we, you actually ahead. signed a contract, I believe, with Capitol Records when you were like 22, right? Something about the Ted Neely Five. <laughs> you have done your research. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, literally, uh, that became uh, that name was invented by a nightclub owner in Hawaii because we were playing uh, on our way to California, you know, and we went through Las Vegas and played in a couple of nightclubs and this gentleman walked up to me on one of our breaks and said, hey, uh, I have a nightclub in Hawaii. Would you guys like to come over for a couple of weeks? Of course, my... I couldn't. I grabbed him and said, you, you "We'll go tonight if you'll take us over there." You know, one of those mm-hmm. kind of things. Anyway, he brought us over for two weeks and we were there, ready for almost two years wow. uh, in a place called the Peppermint Lounge. And when we got to Hawaii and we go to the club to load up our stuff on the marquee, it said the Ted Neely Five. Now he I put read that on the marquee. I read that that maybe it was that marquee, maybe it was another one. That the marquee appeared like in the background in an episode, a '60s episode of Dragnet. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was it was early '60s, yes, yes, because this was in '62. So wow. you know, we did out did that thing, and it, 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 it was the same guy that was in Hawaii that had the nightclub. He was doing so successfully with his peppermint lounge that he then went to Los Angeles and opened a club right on the Sunset Strip called the Trip, and he brought us to that nightclub and that's the nightclub where that marquee was wow <laughs> so it's all been being in the right place at the right time with people who are generous and really loved what we did and helped us do everything one thing led to another and you know now i can sit here and tell you the truth about it and it's amazing i'm gonna look back on it but i just can't believe how fortunate we were well you were kind of featured as as the ted neely five either in a marquee or in an appearance in uh, the pilot episode of the 60s in the incarn- uh, incarnation of uh, Dragnet, but also you were in an unaired episode that led the cancelization of the Smothers Brothers. <laughs> uh, let me ask you something. Uh, I'm, I'm, working on, I'm working on a book. Could I be calling you for information? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't the Ted Neely fire that caused the show to be canceled. I mean, what happened, Ted? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know, things happen. We uh, had we had reached that place in in Los Angeles where we were playing all the nightclubs that were available because the people who came to see us were mostly in the entertainment industry, and that gave us a, a, a fan base, so to speak. So all those nightclub owners in Los Angeles area knew that if we came to their nightclub, that group of people would come, and they did. Wow. And that's where some other brothers first saw us when we were doing that. And they brought us on once, and then they made us semi-regulars. And then when they would started doing the Summer Brothers Smother shows, they had us as regulars on the show. I remember Glenn Campbell was the host for one season, and we were there with him. Odd with me about that is the first session we did on Capitol Records, we went into Capitol Records studio to start working on our first CD. I'm mean, excuse first CD, our first <laughs> album. And and we get into the first session. We were in there and went, went into the studio and there was a big grand piano over on one side of the room and we're setting up all of our stuff and there was a guy sleeping on the floor mm-hmm. under the piano. That guy was Glenn Campbell. Wow. He'd really? been there the night before. Yeah, he'd been wow. there the night before until like three o'clock in the morning doing wow. sessions. <laughs> he fell asleep. I've got to ask so you. Crazy. About the Smothers Brothers, because we got sent a video from our listeners, and this is where I first became aware of it, and I think it was Tommy Smothers that introduced you, and he introduced you as the Teddy Neely Weirdy Five, <laughs> like, like weird as in weird, what the hell was that about? Well, because when we when we got to be there with them a lot, you know, we, we all became friends, and they... Tommy and Dick were such sweethearts to us and helping that nobody knew who we were, but they loved what we did, and so there we were. 
And when you do a show like that, they uh, you, you go in on Monday, and they have the reading and the plans of all the screen trips and the jokes and the funny things that are going to happen through the week. And uh, on those Mondays, everybody who's in the show sits and watch the writing staff mm -hmm. do the performance of what's going on, the dialogue and the jokes and the whatever street things are happening. And guess who one of those writers was for this Mother's Brothers? Somebody from Jesus Christ Superstar? No. I don't no, know. One, one of the most famous comedians in the world. Uh, okay, He's Pat not, Paulson. Well, that's close. Oh, that's okay. really close. Uh, think in terms of... You think about that. Let me go on and answer your question here. About <laughs> uh, the reason the reason he, he referred to that <laughs> was the fact that we all told so many jokes with each other and played tricks on each other and constantly were doing things to make each other laugh because that was the nature of this Mother's Brothers show right. when they were rehearsing, you know. So when he, when they found out that we were just as crazy as they were, they, we became that. That's what they called us in in the dressing rooms and oh, on rehearsals. So how it, they referred to us. It's a nickname they gave you then, kind of. That that's right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I, I've right. got to find out. You know, in knowing uh, Tommy and Dick, like went through hell because of the censorship, and and the yes. network coming down. Did they talk to you about their frustrations at all? Oh yeah, but it was you know certainly private and all that the bottom yeah. line was they were doing what they felt would make the, the people happy but at that particular time the management of the network was a little more conservative than were the smothers brothers so to speak yeah. and uh they took issue with a lot of things and a lot of times it uh, it got to a point to where they almost had to submit their scripts you know each week to make sure they were approved by the network or they were just going to shut them down then so wow but uh, there were lots of things that happened. Uh, none of them uh, was a situation that I felt deserved them being canceled, but yeah. it happened, and so you move on, you know. So. And it's so great they're still with us today. They're actually going to do a reunion of some kind together. and that's Yeah, cool. yeah. And they're, they're, they're great. They're just, <laughs> they're just great. Now, where are you guys right now? I know you're somewhere in, in, in the L.A. area, California. So. We are. We're about, uh, about 40 minutes north of Hollywood. Oh, well, we're probably pretty close to being neighbors. Yeah. You know, we just bought a house. We got a, a new house, and we got the studio here in the home. And if I would have known your son was a realtor, <laughs> <laughs> I would have bought it from him. Well, I'm telling you what, he, he we're so proud of Zach. He's doing so well, and he's making so many friends. It would have just thrilled him to death if he'd have been able to represent you guys. But, yeah. You know, when you get ready for that $100 million home, give Zach a call. Oh, that we will. There now, I have to ask you, I have to ask you, Ted, because, okay, I'm a huge musical theater nerd, okay? And along your career, you were involved in two out of my top three favorite musicals of course one was jesus oh christ superstar and the wow. other one was hair yeah <laughs> so now am i right in understanding didn't being involved in hair kind of lead to being involved with jesus christ superstar how did that all happen no question whatsoever and my being involved with hair was a complete accident i promise you because even though I loved all kinds of entertainment, it never even entered my mind that I would go into theater and or films. I just wanted to sit there and scream behind the drums and sing. You know, that was my desire. Right. So so one, you know, I told you about how the fans followed us around, the, the, the entertainment people mm -hmm. in the industry it would go to clubs. Well, the, since we were able to do that and bring those kind of in, in, important people in who spend a lot of money and then come back and bring a lot more friends the next night, so to speak, the club owners really liked our band and booked us constantly to the point that they would see what we would do during a, 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 an evening of playing, which most bands just, you know, get up and play 45 minutes of music and take a break and come back and play another 45 till 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. But we, we coming from Texas and being weird, <laughs> we... <laughs> We actually did a floor show at a specific time each night. You know, the dance floor would be cleared, and we'd move our stuff out on the dance floor, and we'd do an hour of like a Vegas act, you know, and people enjoyed that a lot. So the the, the people who owned the clubs watched what we did, because when we take a 15-minute break, we'd all go around in the audience and introduce ourselves and say, hey, is there anything you want to hear? We'll play whatever you want. And so they would, at the night when they would close out the club, they would let, they would actually let us choose a group of people to stay in with us. They would lock the doors, 
and we'd sit there and talk for an hour, hour and a half, and mm. have a good time. And then Perfect. the next plant, the place would be full. Well, one of those nights, our group of buddy actors, there were five of them who came no matter where we were, they came and brought friends. Stood up and said, Ted, uh, are you guys working in the day tomorrow? And, of course, we play at night. I said, no, not at all. Why? He said, because we, we're, we're all going for an audition for a show, mm. and we'd love for you to come and see what we had to go through as actors and singers to get a job. So I went. Met him at, the, at this theater in Hollywood around 2 in the afternoon, and it, the, the parking lot was packed with people standing, waiting to go into the building. Mm. And the actor turned to me and said, man, I didn't know it was what we call an a- actor's act of the union open call. Mm-hmm. Anybody, anybody can show up. So you're going to have to just follow us, stay with us as a group, listen to what we say to the people who ask us questions outside before you go in. But if you don't do this, you don't get in the building. It was simple stuff. They said, you know, what are your acts, your likes, and all this. And I just paraphrase whatever they said and we all went inside so we get inside and we're waiting in the lobby and the, the, the door to the theater itself is closed we can hear the auditions we can't see anything so they, they give you a name tag and a number they call your number you go up and audition so there i've got a number they've all got a number they, they call the five guys that were in front of me one at a time and when they finished they came out and we started to leave and as we got to the door they called my name and my number and I kept walking. I didn't know. <laughs> I wasn't there to audition. I was there just to see it. Yeah. I didn't know, but the, these actors had auditioned for this director before, and they knew him. And they planned with this director to literally put me on the stage oh. to get me up there to maybe audition. Whether you liked so, it or not. Exactly. I, they just lifted, <laughs> literally lifted me up, five of them, and carried me down the aisle of the theater and <laughs> tossed me on the stage. <laughs> now, inside the theater, it was completely dark. No lights at all except a, a work light on, next to the piano player on the stage. It was it. Just a, a lamp with no shade. So I get up off the, the stage floor, and I walk over and start talking to the piano player. Then I hear, are you Mr. Neely? From the <laughs> audience. And it's dark. I couldn't see anybody. I, I said, Yes. And he says, what have you prepared for us today, Mr. Neely? And I went, oh, God, uh, nothing. I've never done this before. I don't <laughs> know what you want me to do. <laughs> so he said, if, uh, do you sing, Mr. Neely? And I said, yes. He said, would you sing us an up-tempo rock song that shows us your ability to, you know, to move, uh, to feel the rhythm, and uh, let us hear your voice? See, I, I was thinking, thinking that's what they would want, because it would have been bad if you would have done... Well, like in the Smothers Brothers, you did something always there to remind me, and that wouldn't have worked. <laughs> you, you, you even know that. <laughs> i got to be careful what I'm saying here. You might catch me uh, telling the truth. <laughs> no, but you're absolutely right. So I, I thought, okay, it's a Broadway show of some sort. I don't know. And see, one of the things that made people come to see our floor show is that all of us were doing impersonations of singers. Oh, okay. We were... were we were all good singers. We were terrible musicians, but we could sing. So uh, one of the impersonations I was doing was Stevie Wonder singing for once in my life. So I turned to the piano player and I said, uh, do you know Stevie Wonder's version of for once in my life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, what key? What key? I said, I don't care. Just play. I'll catch up. He starts playing the piano and I sang it. When I finished, I was shaking in my boots and yeah. I start to walk off the stage. And the voice says, well, pardon me, Mr. Neely. Uh, could you sing us a love song? Uh, preferably a, a ballad with passion uh, that shows your vocal range and blah, 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 blah. And I thought, ah, okay. One of the other persons I was impersonating was Tony Bennett. Mm. So I said to the piano player, same song, think Tony Bennett. So we did that. And they hired me. They didn't hire any of the five actors. Wow. And now they didn't talk yeah. anymore. You're, they weren't your friends anymore. The, the, the kid from Texas took our jobs. I mean, you know. That's ex- exactly right. The, the no talent kid from Texas. All those guys had gone to acting workshops and classes and studied and all that. And, you know, I'm just screaming behind the drum. So, anyway, so that director that chose me for hair, wonderful man named Tom O'Horgan, he was one of the co collaborators with Rado and Ragney and McDermott at the creation of the show. He directed the original hair, and he took me under his wing as if I were his son. He did everything he could to help me not fall off the stage and be able to walk and chew gum at the same time and sing and all that. And so when that hair experience was finished, I went back to Texas and I put together some guys, and we were in in Colorado 
playing in a nightclub. Mm -hmm. And I get a call one night saying, Ted, it's Tom. They've asked me to direct the world premiere theatrical production of the show of the Hair musical, and I want you in the show. Just like that. He said, but the producers don't know your work, so pick up the album, choose a song, and come to New York and sing for us. Wow. So I did. So I listened to the album, and guess what I sang for my audition for Hair? Ah, uh, good morning, Starshine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. I don't know how long. <laughs> <laughs> If I'd have done that for the Smothers Brothers, they would have put it on. <laughs> <laughs> did you get any no. reaction? Like, did these people know? I mean, at the time, you had your album out with the Ten Daily Five, right? I mean, did that help at all? Yeah, but they didn't have a clue. You know, <laughs> they weren't people who they were. They were, you know, producers, financial people. They, uh -huh. weren't, they weren't the artistic side. You know, they just felt that Tom O'Horgan was going to because he had direct, originally directed in Hair. They felt Tom could make it work. So. <laughs> I, I went there and I sang Heaven on Their Minds, the first song mm. in the show, which is Judas. Is right. Yeah. Because when I listened to the album, I just fell in love with the character of Judas. And honestly, I had no even imaginable thought of pretending to be Jesus. Because why? Because, you know, I grew up in Texas. I Like you, you went to Christian school. I was in Christian school and Bible school and all that all my teenage life. Everybody in the world knows Jesus. And Nobody I don't I don't think world. anybody envisions themselves that I can play Jesus. Right. I mean, that is the role to play. That is the role that would strike fear in the hearts of any actor. <laughs> well, it sure struck the fear with me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I didn't even think about it. I just listened to the music, and the music that, that, that I really felt like, well, I'd like to sing that, uh, was the songs that Judas sang. And I thought, well, that'll give me a chance to develop a character, and with Tom O'Horgan, because he helped me develop Claude and what I did in hair and all that. And so that's what I sang. I sang Heaven on Their Minds. Now, when I walked on the stage for that audition, there was Tom with the two men, I assume, were the producers, sitting about the fourth row in the center. And uh, I walked out there, and I sang Heaven on Their Minds. And when I finished, Tom literally jumped out of his seat and he ran up onto the stage. And I'm thinking, oh, I got the part. This is great. This is great. He came over. He gave me this beautiful, warm hug. And he said, Ted, that was great. But would you please do me a favor? I said, sure, anything, Tom. He said, would you please come back tomorrow and sing The Other Guy? The Other Guy. The Other Guy. <laughs> Reminds me of Michael That's Cole of the Mod Squad who wrote a book and said, guy. I'm the white guy. <laughs> 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 well, that was Tom hard. He just said, the other guy. So, you know, I, I wondered I, something, and I, I definitely don't mean this to be racist or anything. Why do they always cast Judas as being a black man? You ever thought about only that? I uh, thought, are you kidding me? That's been a, a thing in all of our ears since the day it was done. And I'll, I will tell you Norman Jewison's answer to that. Okay. Okay. Because once we were doing the film and the people, the industry found out that a black man had been cast as Jews, every interview he was doing, they asked him that, why, 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 why? And uh, Norman is just like us. There's not a bigoted bone in his body. Mm -hmm. and his answer was because Carl Anderson was the best singer and actor for the part. Right. Period. Absolutely. Okay, so, so bottom line here is when I went back the next day to sing for... Tom, uh, I just happened to choose the, the song Gethsemane to sing. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you well know, I've been singing Gethsemane ever since. And that's your favorite too, isn't it? Well, i I got to tell you this. The music that's in this production is magnificent. Uh, there's not a song in there that isn't absolutely wonderful. There's just something about Gethsemane, and I can do a three-hour speech about that, that happens within the confines of that song that is a movement spiritually every single time I get a chance to sing right. it. Yes. And I've been singing it a couple of times, you know. More than <laughs> a couple of times, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do, you really have any, do you really have any idea how many times you played well, Jesus? I've, I've done the, the, the shows, I've done well over 5,000 shows wow. of this particular production, and, and, and 
every time that we do it, the, the, it's almost as if it's the first, well, it's definitely like the first time for me, yeah. but they get the same feeling from the audiences as well. The audiences, you, well, the underlying thing about this song and what makes it fresh for me every time is, is once Tom taught me about, you know, going in and analyzing what the characters are doing and putting yourself in that place in your own relationship with God and your family and life. When I realized that that song, written brilliantly by Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber, was a man talking to his father, trying to find out why his dad wants to kill him. Yeah. Right. So when you look at the human side, and that's what Jesus Christ Superstar is about. It's about the human spirituality of the man called Jesus of Nazareth. Right. Mary Looking Magdalene last, says he's just a man. And, you know. that, and Yeah, they yeah. do. And Carl, Carl <laughs> Judas said that too. Yeah. So, so the thing is, they wrote this from that point of view, and not to be sacrilegious nor anti-biblical. Mm -hmm. They took that magnificent thing that has lasted for so long in our religious history, and looked at the man through the eyes of his contemporaries, both friends and enemies, before anyone knew he was anything more than a soft-spoken, freedom-loving, spiritual human being. Right. So you see the human side of this man through the eyes of all the humans that were with him at the same time. That's what makes it magical. That's what makes it work. That's what that I've, I've been told that by audiences now for all these years that they get a chance to look at the human being. Yeah. Now, when you not first taking away from Jesus, right? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say when you first got involved. Uh, from what I understand, uh, you became the Jesus Christ understudy, and I believe that Judas at the time was being played by Ben Vereen, who we love Ben Vereen as well. I mean, Carl was yes, your friend, yes, we but do. they were both great. Yeah. But, but, but I'd worked with Ben. I had worked with Ben in hair. Oh, okay, yeah, right. So ben and, ben and I were buddies, you see. So that was great. So go ahead, I'm sorry you were going to ask. My, my, my favorite Ben Vereen thing, I must say, my daughter sitting next to me, <laughs> Zubily Zoo. He did some kid show called Zubily oh, Zoo. Yeah. And, and he was made up, what was he, a fox? He was the mayor. But he was, they were yeah, all animals. he was a fox. But anyway, great, great show. So how did you go from being understudy? When did they say, you're not understudy anymore, you are now the main guy, you're Jesus. I mean, go out and do it. <laughs> oh, they caught me baptizing people backstage. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, you know, when the cast is around you all the time, they start to maybe believe you're something special. Yeah. Ah, that's all bull. Uh, well, let me just say this. I, uh, Tom wanted me to be Jesus, and he wanted Ben to be Judas. Right. Mm -hmm. He didn't know about Carl. Uh, ben and I had worked together under Tom's tutelage and direction in hair. And uh, Ben originally was HUD, the character HUD, and then he moved up to Burger, and I was the understudy and moved up to Jesus, you see. So, so the thing is, <laughs> Ben was amazing. The difference was the very first national tour of Jesus Christ Superstar, mm -hmm. as this is before anything even was considered the possibility of a show, is when the album was out. And Robert Stigwood, who was the executive producer of that, being the manager of Eric Clapton and the Bee Gees, and he, he knew all about concerts. So he, it was his idea that they put together a concert, and it was the band on stage with singers singing. It wasn't the production or it was staging and all that. It was just a, a live concert. And uh, Carl Anderson was hired to do that. So Carl was doing Judas live on stage long before this became a Broadway show. Mm. So he was certainly in contention for the role as well. Yeah. Um, but there was a man that, that was playing with them uh, on that national tour that uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber and uh, Robert Stigwood really thought was the perfect person for Jesus. So they told Mr. O'Horgan that they wanted him to be Jesus in the New York production. And Tom came to me and said, here's what's going on. Uh, they would like this man to play Jesus, and therefore I would like you to understudy Jesus and please be, you know, in the cast. Well, since Tom O'Horgan was so active with me and, and taught me so much, literally, I, I would do anything for Tom. If Tom said, 
said I want you to sweep out the stage every night after the show, I would have done it as if it were an exercise as an actor to get mm -hmm. better into the character because of who he was. Mm -hmm. So I had no problem with that at all. Well, one night, this man was not there. And I went on in his place. And I don't know if you've seen, have you been to New York to see any kind of Broadway shows? Never been to New York, ever. Well, it, it happens pretty much everywhere, but definitely in New York. Anytime that the show goes on and the, the people who are the lead characters, if there's anybody who isn't there, they'll make an announcement before mm -hmm. the show starts right. to right. say that... Them, and they go, ladies and gentlemen, tonight the role of Jesus, played normally by blah, 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 will be played by blah, blah, blah. And instantly, the first thing I hear from the audience was, oh. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to ask. Meanwhile, you're you're backstage, and you're thinking, "I'm somebody from Texas who likes to say yeehaw." <laughs> and, and how can I do this? I mean, were you thinking that? I got to tell you, there, there, there were times when you know when the, that first big silent scream comes in Gethsemane. I've been tempted so many times to go yeehaw. <laughs> 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 oh God! So, so that and that's how I was brought on the stage with the, the audience being, "Oh God, let's get out of here, get our money back." But and Benny was was Judas. Um, Carl wasn't with us. Carl stayed with that tour. Uh, Benny was there, and we did it together. And whenever we got to Gethsemane, that audience they went, uh, "Did a standing ovation." There you go. There you go. Hey, they you did, know they didn't. They don't think about an understudy being able to, you know, do what needs to be done. And yeah. they went there to see the man who was the character that was hired to do it. But whenever it happened... So, now, think about this. I, I, imagine how you would feel if that happened. You go on and do the show and do the best you can. Mm -hmm. Then the, the standing ovation happens. And applause, 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 applause. Well, that was really feeding my ego. Oh, you know yeah. What I mean... I mean that it, you know uh, it, that that guy that wanted to go yeehaw. I came close <laughs> to doing it right then. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, I, I mean, you already wanted to be a rock star, and and being a rock star and being on stage is kind of like a religious experience. And then you have the religious experience of the play. I mean, it's got to be the best high ever. Oh my God, it was it was unbelievable, and on Broadway. Yeah. yeah. Lord, here I am. Broadway, I couldn't even spell it, much less know anything about it, you know. So so when that happened, uh, I was obviously putting off all kinds of glowing air and all that. And the next thing that happens is, is the, the Judas character, you know, comes up quietly and kisses Jesus on the cheek, you right. know, and it goes on. Well, <laughs> the way the set was, it, the, the little table that Mr. Horgan designed for us to have our Last Supper around was actually triangular and built like a, a mountain. You know, it was triangular thing right in the middle of the stage, down center. And uh, the, the the peak of it, when we were having the Last Supper, was at Jesus' heart. And it went down to the floor level in the front, and mm -hmm. all the apostles were triangularly around it. Well, once the, the Gethsemane started to play, the way Tom had choreographed it, while the orchestra is giving the intro, then the, the, the cast as stagehands uh, turned the, 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 the mountain around so that it, the middle of it there when it gets before the, the scream happens Jesus has to basically climb a little bit up that mountain right. see? that was the set so I'm on the top of the mountain when the, when the standing ovation <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and, and Benny comes up there to kiss me and just as he gets within kissing range if you will I slipped. My knee slipped, and I fell off the mountain. Oh, I, you know, I almost said to myself, there's got to be stuff happen. I mean, you know, like, I always wondered if you got your robe caught in something, but this is even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anything can happen, I'm telling you. But, but you know, that to me, that was the, the big man upstairs uh, making me realize that I can't get my ego up because yeah. uh, things like that will happen and will ruin it right yeah, there. Yeah, that, that, the audience <laughs> adulation will make you think you're Jesus, but when things like that happen, uh -oh. you're reminded you are not Jesus, okay? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Let me... I, cannot, I cannot tell you how many millions of times I have said that to people, you know? <laughs> and, and then I follow that by saying, I'm a screaming rock and roll drum of Texas. That's right. really lucky. Well, That's it. Let me ask you, Ted, I mean, if you... 
hair already, you know, back when you were doing hair. Now, hair had controversy in the fact that at the time, you know, cast, there was a nude scene in hair on stage, things like that. And then you go into doing Jesus Christ Superstar. Were you worried about going into doing that play and the controversy from all the people that are like, okay, well, you know, you're, you're messing with religion. People are going to get upset. Were you worried about going down that road? To be honest with you, certainly because of my background, uh, that's why I didn't <laughs> audition for Jesus to start with. And certainly even being having the possibility of a connection uh, even more powerful like in a film, oh, absolutely anything. So so the thing about it was the reason that, that <laughs> I was able, as I told you, to get into both of those was Tom Oregon. Mm -hmm. And 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 I I was I wasn't planning on doing any other shows. It, it, because when I finished hair, I got the band back together and we were playing. That's that's what I wanted to do. See, so I, I wasn't thinking about that at all. So uh, after I got to do it and then I went back in the chorus line I, uh, excuse me, the chorus of the show, not the show chorus line, sorry. Right. <laughs> uh uh, the guys in the guys in the cast, they would go to auditions for other shows almost every day, mm -hmm. guys and girls. And I, I didn't know why. I, I, I just said to them, guys, why, why are you auditioning? You have a job. And their response, because they were trained actors, they said, well, Ted, you got to build your resume. You know, you got to do many shows. And, and, uh, and those same shows. guys are thinking, yeah, well, Ted was like that always. That's why he's still doing Jesus Christ Superstar because <laughs> he's satisfied. <laughs> If you got something yeah. good, why look for something else, you know? That's that's right. You're exactly right. I was taught when I was a child, you should get a good job. Hold on to it. <laughs> 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 so, so I went with them to an audition. They said, we're going to audition. It's like the guys in the nightclub that said, we're auditioning tomorrow. So I thought, what? I have nothing to lose. So I went. And uh, they talked me into singing a song. They said, you know, this director will see you. Who knows? He might want you to make something else. Anyway, so <laughs> the audition was for the world premiere of Tommy to be done in Los Angeles. I got the role of Tommy. Wow. Above all these wonderful actors and singers and dancers who auditioned right there with me. Uh, again, screaming is good. I yeah. Guess, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so when you think about what uh, coming out of hair like you mentioned about the nude scenes and the protesting and all that yeah. and going into superstar the great thing about my being in hair i played the role of claude yeah yeah person the person who didn't yes participate so, I, I, so the, to speak i i assume i assume the quiet homegrown boy that was like what well you know that kind of fit because yeah. he was with i think the guy in the movie I, I only know the movie i didn't see the play wasn't he from texas I believe so. Yeah, yeah we well, went off to to the Vietnam War, and yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, that was that was the whole idea of it. And and uh, the irony. Uh, let me put a little pin in that because you said you went off to be in the war. Uh -huh. I'll finish this question you're asking, and we'll we'll go to that because right. it's 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 very important in my chance to continue. Um, so the idea of of being in hair was to me an impressive accomplishment because hair is the show that opened the door for broadway musicals to allow rock music yes. to come in yes. it was the first yes sir it was and had it not been for hair there would have been no superstar on yeah. broadway because it was a rock opera mm -hmm. and everybody assumed completely anti-religious you see so it had doubled the, the protest that hair did so so the fact that i was in <laughs> hair first for all that time then superstar and then they pulled me out of superstar to go to do tommy because they were auditioning in new york for the show to start like two months later after rehearsals and so on so i left superstar in new york and went back to los angeles to be in tommy and i'm, I'm so happy that that worked that way as much as i was just aching to do superstar for a long time to learn more about that with Tom Oregon because Tom Oregon wasn't directing Tommy so I, I went to LA and we're <laughs> we're doing our rehearsals and the way you build these shows they, they spend between four and six weeks rehearsing and then on the last week of that rehearsal schedule it's called preview week you rehearse all day and right. you do a performance at night for an audience for live audience and uh, 
And while we're rehearsing, I'm reading the Hollywood Reporter, you know, like the act, all the actors said, you know, you got to look at the Hollywood Reporter and see what's out, and you got to audition, you know, some reading. And I see this, this the article says, Norman Jewison is in Los Angeles now auditioning for his film production of Jesus Christ Superstar. Mm -hmm. And of course, my heart just hit the floor because I can't, I can't get out of it, can't get out of rehearsals to go to an audition for something because I'm the central character, you know. And and the week that they were doing the auditions was preview week, so I'm rehearsing all day and doing a show at night. And you would think now, you would actually get the job, but that's not the way it works. Well, I, I, to be honest with you, no. I, I honestly just wanted to meet Norman Jewison, and I yeah. felt the fact that I'd been in in the superstar in New York, it gave me a you know advantage to get through the door somehow. Mm -hmm. I had no agent or manager or anything like that, and I'm pacing the floor during my moments of Tommy in rehearsal, thinking, "What can I do? How can I reach this man?" And somebody said, "Well, you know, there's a thing called a director's guild. Maybe you can catch into that." Yeah. So I contacted the director's guild, and I called and said, uh, "Pardon me, is uh, do you have uh, an agent representative for uh, the director Norman Jewish?" And, yeah, hold on, just a two seconds later, they came back and they gave me his agent's number. Mm. William Morris Agency. So I went, what the heck? I called the William Morris Agency. <laughs> Keep in mind, nobody knows me from Adam, period. Right. But I'm, 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 I want to do this. I want to meet Norman Jewison. I don't care if I'm sweeping the floor during the Last Supper. I want to meet Norman Jewison. So. <laughs> Damn, you're, you're smart. You work the way we do. You should get guests for us. I mean, you could be a guest worker. Man. <laughs> oh, it's great. So I did call, and, and they, uh, I said, hey, Norman Jewison's agent, just a moment. And two minutes later, hello? I said, uh, uh, pardon me, are you Mr. Jewison's agent? Yes, who's this? I said, well, you, you won't know me. Uh, I'm an actor, a singer. I'm here in L.A. We're rehearsing uh, the world premiere of the rock opera Tommy. And he, oh, yeah, we've heard about that. We hear it, uh, it looks really good in the assholes. I said, he said, what is it that you want to do? And he said, do you need an agent? <laughs> I said, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I said, probably, yeah. But I, I, what I'm calling about right now is is I read that Mr. Jewison is doing auditions here for his movie. And the guy said, yes. I said, well, I'm blown away because I, I didn't know there was a movie. But I was in the Broadway show production, and I would like Mr. Jewison to at least say hello to me, and we can talk for a minute. And he said, well, let me see if I can get a hold of him and, and uh, we can set up a, a meeting and I said well I have a problem there sir sorry but uh, we're doing the Tommy and we're rehearsing uh, days and performing nights I cannot get out of this to go meet with Mr. Jewison what I'm calling for is to see if maybe you could invite him for me to come see the show and let the show be my audition mm. and there was a moment of silence there and he said well I'll tell you what I'll call him right now and I'll call you right back and I'm thinking, thank. I went, thank you very much, sir. And he hung up. And I'm thinking, well, that was a smooth way of him telling me to get off the phone. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but five minutes later, he called back and said, I talked to Norman. He's heard about the rehearsals, and he'd love to come see the show. When would you like him to come in? I said, I don't care. Anytime he wants, but I don't want to know he's in the audience because I'll be scared to death, and I'll probably blow the dialogue and mess up. He said, okay, we'll figure it out. So... Long story getting longer. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not a dancer. Um, the everybody in that show was a dancer, including all the principals, except for myself and the man who played my uncle Ernie. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little um, hard to dance in robes too. Yep. You know, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> you, you've done. You, you've done this, haven't you? <laughs> Yeah, well, I did dress at Jesus for an event one time. But it, did, did you fall down at all? No. I, I don't know. I probably wasn't appropriate. I didn't wear underwear, so it was... It, you know. <laughs> but when, when you guys were doing your show that Norman came to... Yeah, with Tommy, yeah. Yeah, was that... Uh, that was in the L.A. area, right? I mean, you said that, or... It, it was at the Aquarius Theater. Okay, oh, Aquarius yeah. Theater, yeah. Very good. Yeah, it was, uh, and it was the world premiere because the the Who decided to do Tommy as a as a show yeah. without them in it because Superstar was so successful, and they were there to help us put it all together. It was remarkable wow. to have them there giving us suggestions and ideas for characters and all of that. It was just absolutely wonderful. Now, when now, you, did, you you got it, you found out uh, along with Carl, right? I mean, didn't they cast Carl and you at the same well, time? Well, but 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 
forgive me for this, but you, you have to know the punchline. Yeah, back up. Oh, sure, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm throwing at you, sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> so the choreography for Tommy was brilliant. Right. And uh, as you know, Tommy has, an, an, all Broadway shows have an overture. Mm -hmm. Well, Tommy has an overture and an undertour. Right. Tommy has the overture to begin the show, then at the, when you flip the album over, which was where the second act started, you had a, at the end of that first album, first side was the undertour, just music, you see. <laughs> All that, just great music. Well, the stage of Tommy looked like a pinball machine because it was well, out of Pinball Wizard. Right. It was built to look like that. Excellent. So the, 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 the undertour was strictly choreography, no singing. But the the director and the choreographer wanted the Tommy character in it because they didn't want him to not to forget about Tommy and, and start doing other things. So uh, they knew I didn't dance. So guess what they had me? How they inserted me in the undertour? How um, I don't know. The, I became the pinball. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, wow, that's perfect. That's what they decided. Tommy would be the pinball, and I'm not joking. Is that? They, there were there were dancers in this show that were brilliant dancers, but they all looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> were four guys, literally, they were so muscle bound, big giant guys. They were great dancers, and so uh, as the undertour happened, they tossed me around at certain spots on the stage. Oh my so God! Really? Pinballed. Bing, 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 and I was having the time of my life, like a little <laughs> six-year-old kid in my first circus, yeah. flying through the air. <laughs> but one, one, of, one of those nights when we were doing that, and we we had it down so beautifully. Uh, the man who caught me in one of the moments, the Arnold Schwarzenegger guy, uh, was out of the show. His understudy was in. And both the understudy and I misjudged a certain thing we were doing, and we fell and we bashed our heads against one of the leagues of the, of the stage, and we were knocked out cold mm. in the song. Oh, the no. dancers were so professional and so well organized and so <laughs> dancing, they made it look like that was planned and got us off the stage, <laughs> drug us literally off the stage <laughs> like we were part of the pinball game, you know? So at intermission, the doctor checked us out and said, well, I think you're both okay for tonight, but do not go on tomorrow night because you might be dizzy and you could hurt yourselves and other people, so forget about tomorrow night. So that's the night Norman Jewison came to see the show. Of course and I wasn't is. there. Of course. All right? So I found, I found out the next day, the agent called and said, where were you last night? Mr. Jewison came. Wow. You were not in the show. You blew, uh, they're like, you're like, damn, I blew it. Absolutely. By accident. I, I, not, I, absolutely. And wow. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I explained to him what happened. I said, is, is there any chance he can come back tonight or tomorrow and see it? He said, no. He said, Norman and his wife are leaving first thing in the morning, uh -huh. going back to London. So you blew it. That's just how he said it. You yeah. blew it. I said, oh, my God. I said, you're not going to believe this, but I'm asking you one more favor. He said, so what is that? I said, is there any way you can reach Mr. Jewison and, and let me invite him to lunch today? I have rehearsal starting at 1, but is it, and you heard this guy kind of take a deep breath, and he said, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'm nobody, but I, I want to meet Norman Jewison. I'm a huge fan of his work, and I just want to say hello, please. Uh, is it possible? He said, okay, Ted, I, I'll call him. I'll, I'll call you right back. Man, you're what lucky you he gave you the time of day, because I know what these people are like. I mean, I live here in the Hollywood area. I know what they don't care. I mean, it's like we're busy, and yeah, you're lucky. Absolutely, I'm, I was surprised he even answered the phone the first time I called. Yeah. You see, you know, or the person put me on with him. So I, here I, I'm, you know, counting my blessings while I'm doing this. You know, so he he let, called back five minutes. Said Norman, we'll meet you at this hotel at noon. This was nine o'clock in the morning when we were talking. He said, <laughs> he said uh, uh, go there and have lunch with him. Uh, so, I'm okay. He said, and don't bother waiting in the lobby. Just go up to the room. He gave me the room number. Just knock on the door, and uh, Norman will receive you. So, uh, okay, crap. Now, the first thing that hit my brain was, okay. <sighs> They'd already advertised the possibility of certain people, uh, not Carl nor myself, mm -hmm. but people who were being... So they're chosen for principals in the films. Yeah, so am I, I right in knowing that uh, 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 John Travolta wanted to play Jesus and auditioned? According, according to everybody I've met, they told me they wanted to play Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and Travolta is one of those people who said that. Yeah. yeah. But I had no idea. And honestly, I, I wasn't going to audition, going there to, to, to get the movie. I'm, I'm, had, I'm not an actor. I had no experience. I'd never been in a film. I knew nothing. He, and Norman Jewison, Academy Award winner, he's going to hire people who are professionals and got it together. Yeah. I just wanted to sit down with the man and talk for a few minutes. Maybe he'd think of some Texas movie where I could go, yee <laughs> <you know? laughs> So, so uh, I, I'm sorry this is going on so long, but it's oh, that's okay. that you'll, that since, since you're such a fan, you'll understand yeah. Yeah. how I'm still amazed that I got to be in this movie. So, so <laughs> uh, I, I guess my information's wrong. It says in my notes that you showed up to meet Norman dressed as Jesus. Well, well I'll, I'll, I'll clear that, clarify that. Uh, I thought, well, what have I got to lose? Uh, I'd already, I had specifically heard about a person that they were considering for Judas, mm -hmm. but nobody for Jesus, because mm -hmm. I would have gone for Judas if I could, but they, they were considering a certain person. So I thought, well, maybe they haven't decided yet. So I, <laughs> the guy who said, Hey, Ted, are you working tomorrow afternoon? We have an audition. When I went for hair, that mm -hmm. actor, yes. mm -hmm. he, and I became, he and I became dear friends. We're still dear friends to this day. That day, I called him and said, Marty, can you do me a favor? He said, sure, what? I said, can you get over here and make me look like Jesus? There you go. <laughs> Literally, because he was into makeup and all that sort of stuff as an actor. So he came to my... The, the hotel I was staying in, put a beard on me, put a wig on me, did the whole makeup thing, you know, because I was doing Tommy. Yeah. I was trying to trying to look 16, you know, with a kid, you know. Right. So, I go to see Norman Jewison. I go, I knock on the door, no answer. I thought, well, that's a way of getting rid of me. But then I knocked on the door again, and again, no answer. And I'd heard all my life in Texas, third time's a charm. Right. You know? So I went, okay, one more time. Bang, bang, bang. Yeah, who is it? I said, it's uh, the guy who wasn't there last night. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're supposed to have lunch today, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, just go downstairs in the, in the hotel restaurant, and I'll be down in a few minutes. Okay. And I'm thinking right then, that's his way of getting rid of me. Okay. You know? So I go down to the coffee shop. I'm not a coffee drinker, but I drink a whole pot of coffee, wait and dream and send my nerves and all that, you know. And half hour later, he hadn't shown up. So I thought, well, that's it. So I got up to pay my check. And while I'm paying my check, I get a tap on the shoulder and I turn. And it's Norman Jewison. Yeah. He said, he said, I guess you thought I wasn't going to show up, didn't you? <laughs> wow. Put his arm on my shoulder and he said, come on, let's sit down and talk. And it was as if he was my big brother or a dear friend from home that came to say hello. He was just openly friendly. And we sat down. And the first thing he said was, I hear you were interested in uh, auditioning for my movie. I said, well, well, sort of. I, I, I want to meet you, sir. And I read that you're auditioning. So I called and I gave him the whole story. Blah, blah. And he said, well, my agent, when he called me, he said, there's some guy <laughs> who wants you to come see his show. And he said, did, did his agent call? He said, he said he didn't have an agent or a manager. And he said, I have to tell you, that amazed me that you, with no agent or no manager, had the wherewithal to catch me. Right. And my agent. That's right. Right. You got have tenacity. That's what he said. He yeah. said, so I wanted, to see, I wanted to see you face to face. I wanted to see your show, but we missed it. He said, I wanted to see you face to face so we could talk. Uh, it was one of the finest conversations I've ever had in my life. And I noticed the whole time we were talking, every once in a while he would be staring me straight in the eyes and he'd put his hand over his mouth to hide a laugh, like he's gonna fall down laughing. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, it's, it's maybe it's my southern drawl or whatever, and I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I found out later he was laughing because I went to the trouble of putting on a wig and a beard and trying to look like Jesus. He didn't tell me that till we were in Israel and was shooting the, the film that he, fell out of his chair when I showed up with a wig. He said it was so obviously, a, the guy wasn't a, you know, a wigster or right, a makeup artist. Right. He, was, he was an actor. He did the best he could. <laughs> anyway, so we talked and he just said, well, Ted, I just want you to know that I'm here in L.A. auditioning for singers and dancers, you know, cast members. Uh, we've already pretty much uh, locked in on our principles, so uh, if you're interested in the film, uh, what would you have me do? I said, well, sir, <laughs> that's up to you. I, I'm working in Tommy, and I just wanted to say hello to you and, 
And well, thank I, you I very would, much for think it would be a hint because you're kind of looking like Jesus sitting there. <laughs> well, but but, this, that, but see, that's what I was saying. He said, "Well, I see you're trying to look like Jesus, but you need it." He said, "He said you need, he said, you need to hire yourself a good makeup artist and a hair man because yeah. you don't look like Jesus. You look like a guy from Texas who's trying to look like Jesus." You know? I, I think anyway, it was. So he said, <clears throat> go ahead. Right. Yeah, but he just said, I admire you for your tenacity and your courage. He said, uh, I, I got to get back to, to London. And he said, uh, I appreciate you coming, and I'm, I'm glad we got a few laughs. I, I appreciate your sense of humor and all that. He said, I'll, I'll get back to you. And he said, thank you very much, and he left. And I think it was so incredible I, casting. I think he was smart to not only cast a good old boy from Texas, but a beautiful Hawaiian lady. Because who would ever think that Jesus and Mary Magdalene would be a Texas boy and some beautiful woman from Hawaii. And for Mary Magdalene. right. Yeah. And so, that, again, that's Norman Jewison, you know. And then to think about the fact that there wasn't one person in that film, whether principal, chorus, yada, yada, who had ever been a lead character in the film in their lives. Barry Denon, who played Pontius Pilate, and Joshua Mostel, who played King Herod, had both done little characters, you know, yeah. sideline characters in films, but none of us, had, the rest of us had even been in front of a film camera, except the dancers who had danced, you know, for films or for television. Right. Well. Now, I gotta so, find out, yeah. you go to Israel to do this film, uh, yeah. it, and, and I've heard you and Yvonne Elliman both talk about how hot it was. The, the conditions had to be grueling. Oh, it was unbelievable, you know. And I it grew up in Texas, you know. Yeah. It's it's hot and humid there, but and it's it, hot it, in Hawaii. But it, yes, it is. But it's cool, hot. You yeah. know, <laughs> Israel, the Negev Desert, man, it, it, it is overwhelming. Uh, and the most precious commodity there was water. We yeah. had so many people working on the crew who, the minute we. Norman Jews would say cut they'd all run to us and one would have a, a cloth that they'd be bathing our forehead and another one would be putting ice on our uh, wrists and then and putting this up on our face you know and, and because there were no trees anywhere no no shade except that the umbrellas they put ours but we didn't sit down that long right. so the bottom line was we were fortunate that Norman Jews once again was kind enough and generous enough to bring us all there so far in advance of actual shooting so we could acclimate to the climate now, I was telling Tiffany that I really don't think that you could do that film over there today because there's so much going on. I mean, it's dangerous with uh, well, war and everything. But it was back then, too. I mean, you had some issues with, with the no. military and stuff, right? No question. That's why they were in the movie. Because every day, this was shortly at the, after the Six-Day War had allegedly finished. Mm -hmm. And they were still bombing the borders around us everywhere. Uh -huh. They weren't interested in us because we were right in the middle of the desert next to the Dead Sea. There was nothing yeah. there they wanted. They were bombing the, the cities and so on, you know. And th the most repeated term in a film is action and cut yeah. by the director. Well, in this one, it was action, cut, and hit the dirt. <laughs> <'Cause here> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Because here come the planes. They're bombing the borders. And they're you know, surrounding us. It wasn't just one direction one day and one next to the next. It was constant. Yeah. And we had to stop shooting so many times because of the sound of the tanks and the sound of the jets, the noise, you know, blah, 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 blah. So Mr. Jewison, bless his heart, when we were experiencing that, he felt, God, maybe, and he told me and Carl and Yvonne and Barry one day that he was thinking of and wanted to know our opinion. I mean, he was talking to us like we were filmmakers and would, you know, know what right. to say. Wanted to know our opinion about what if he decided to have those jets and tanks in the film. Wow, so that's why they're there. And we thought he was joking, but he yeah. wasn't. Because he, and still is, has all his life has been so much against war yeah. and all of that kind of crap that goes on and he thought maybe if he would put a sequence of that in a movie that happened a story that happened 2,000 years ago and suddenly jets and tanks show up over Judas and Jesus it might make people have a second thought about yeah. the waste of war yeah. all it does is create more war <coughs> anyway so that's why they were in the film wow. I, there was a according to trivia there was a, a bus and on the bus license plate, did it say 666? <laughs> Why, you, you're amazing. Um, <laughs> have you written a book on this yet? <laughs> Not yet, no. 
I'm going to leave that up <laughs> to your business partner. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about that is that the bus, I thought you were going to refer to the fact that everybody thought that bus was the bus my band and I traveled in when we were <laughs> rock and roll. Literally, that, that, that was in the, the opening publicity that went out. People were saying, oh, oh, Ted's bus right there. And that's great, you know. And I was amazed to think they wouldn't be able to consider what one would have to do to get a school bus from Texas all the way to Israel. Yeah. You know, uh, even if you could, who can afford to pay for getting it over there? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we played with it and all interviews. Carl and I would be talking about, oh, yeah, we used to drive all over Nevada. And all <laughs> bus, you know. No, it was a school bus from, from Israel. You know, but that wasn't a school bus, but it was a school bus type bus. It was a bus that was used for, for the tourists. Right. Well, we want to get. Now, I, wanted, I wanted to ask really quick. I mean, you know, I've seen a lot of videos of, of you meeting your fans and, and the fan base, your fan base. And the film's fan base is incredible. Uh, but let me ask you, what does it do to your head, to your personality, to play Jesus, not only in the film, in the play, for 46, over 46 years now? Because I've noticed that a lot, sometimes fans, when they meet you, they almost revere you like you are Jesus Christ, like you are the Messiah. Uh, do you find that 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 happens and how do you cope with that i mean i saw a video one time you were meeting a fan backstage and i don't know it, it might have been your beautiful daughter that was filming it uh, by the way your daughter's gorgeous and your wife is gorgeous oh, you met your wife in a you. film that's cool your wife is a dancer in a yeah. film absolutely that's right. awesome so but, if i hadn't have gotten this film i wouldn't have my family that, that's yeah. right yeah. but in in the the video okay you were meeting a fan and and they look at you with admiration of either a rock star or like the Pope almost, yeah. and, and you were kind of like caressing her face. I mean, is there any fans that goes overboard? I mean, do they think you're Jesus or more along the line of what Tiffany was asking? Uh, they all tell me that you are my Jesus. Oh. Wow. There are people, you know, I've been in Europe, what was supposed to be six weeks, we just ended our sixth year over yeah. there doing this Italian tour. And I'm telling you, <laughs> they, I, I can't tell you how many priests that I have met who have come to see the show because the, the, the theater in Rome, it's called Il Teatro Sistina, it's just down the street from the Sistine Chapel. Right. So it, it's the walking distance to the Vatican, you see. So these priests come to see the show all the time. And, and they all want to come back and say hello afterwards. And they do, and I welcome it. And they, every single one of them says to me, I became a priest because of watching this movie. That's amazing. And you know something? If you think about it, okay, in answer to people that criticize Jesus Christ Superstar, first of all, you've never seen it. Like you said, people criticize it, didn't see it, and once they see it, they like it. You're doing good, and you're really doing God's work because you're helping people know the story of what happened and and. To some, it's entertainment, but to some, it's a religious experience, and you're kind of like a preacher in a way. Do you think, I mean, do you think of yourself as kind of like someone that kind of like spreads the gospel in addition to being an actor? Well, uh, first of all, I'm not an actor. <laughs> oh, well. I saw you in a great movie with Jan Michael Vincent. I mean, you that was a good scene, yeah. hanging out with old Jan Michael there. Uh, well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, I do I do my best to do whatever it is the director wants me to do, you know, and then we finish shooting a scene, as they cut, then we all laugh and fall down and say, well, he's, he's, he's a rock and roll screamer. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, so what you're saying about the connection is yeah. absolutely there. And the, the, the first time that I felt that from someone was before the movie was made. It was when Carl and I were asked to do the very first national tour of Superstar after the Broadway show. Broadway still was still running. And this, you know, I'd finished Tommy and, and, and they decided to do the tour while the New York was still successful. And they cast Carl and myself to be Jesus and Judas on that tour at the Universal Amphitheater here in Hollywood, which was built for this show. It, it was. Oh, I didn't show. know that. Oh, it's such a yeah, shame it, they tore it down. 
Wow. Uh, I know, I know. But they, they had better reasons and all that sort of thing. They, the reason that... that uh, better they, reasons? Not it. for Harry Potter world. I mean, I'd rather have... <laughs> Well, they they did talk to me and ask my opinion, and they said, you know, we're going to do Harry Potter. And yeah. I, they said, how do you feel? How do you feel about that? I said, well, why don't you just do a Harry Jesus? And, you know, <laughs> leave the like <laughs> <laughs> so the first time that I felt someone actually thinking that I was that person, uh -huh. the real representative was at the Universal Amphitheater, mm -hmm. and Carl was just like me. We always like to talk to people after the show. Yeah. And since it was an amphitheater, we did it from the stage. And we had it wicked out so that they could walk up on the stage and talk to us, you know. And uh, the night after opening night, which was brilliant, just so incredible, all these people were up there talking to us. And while we were out there, uh, the, as the crowd was getting smaller and smaller, I noticed this pregnant lady, she was very pregnant, waiting in line to see Carl and myself, yeah. and I said to the people, I said, folks, w w would you do me a favor, please? I don't want to push any of you out of the way, but this lovely lady here is pregnant, and maybe we could let her come up? And I'll be, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. So she walks up, kisses Carl on the cheek, turns to me and said, Mr. Neely, she took my hand, said, would you please bless my baby? Oh, she put my hand on her tummy. The minute our hands together touched her tummy, uh -huh. the baby kicked. Uh -huh. And she said, oh my God, you just gave my baby life. I will never forget this as long as I will. You know, and I thought she was joking, but uh -huh. she was, she was dark crying. Just, she just, I, oh, that's the way she was reacting. And that's, and that was before anything happened except for the show. And right. she saw the show, you know, and there. Well, I, so now to make, to make that even more overwhelming, yeah. with you saying them thinking I'm Jesus, fade out. This was that was in 1971. Mm -hmm. Fade out. Now we're in uh, Europe doing this wonderful Italian tour, and I still talk to people every night because that to me is the icing on the cake. Uh, a lot of people in the lobby of the theater, and a little bit up comes this lady, and she reaches out to shake my hand because everybody would do that, and she said. I don't know if you remember or not, Mr. Neely, but Universal Amphitheater, 1971. I came up to you and asked you to bless my oh, child. Really? Oh, really? You're the, oh, you're the pregnant lady. Wow. Yes, and this, this is the child. Oh, man. Wow. It, it's definitely an experience for everybody. I, I was so touched. We were doing our research and watching videos last night, and I saw you uh, on a curtain call where you guys are taking your applause. And, and there was so much. You were crying. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. gets to you. And, and it not only I, touches I everybody, it touches you. I can't hold it back. It's just, there are people, in, especially in Rome, but all over Europe where we've played, but especially in Rome because that's, we call that our home in Rome. That's the town that we started in. The, the, the production is, he's there. Production company is in Rome. And we always go to the same theater, Il Teatro Sistina. So it's home, you see. Yeah. And there have been people who come back and come back, and it happens everywhere. People come back many times. There are people in it, in Rome who have seen this production over a hundred times. Wow. wow. Now and I, they keep coming back. I, I have to tease you a little bit, Ted, because there seems to be a, a running biblical theme, a biblical rock opera theme running through your career. Because we had on a, a director friend of ours a couple of years ago to promote a new movie he did by the name of his name is Darren Lynn Bowsman. And <laughs> <laughs> and of course I love Darren. you were you were on Heaven's Side when you played God's publicist in Hallelujah the Devil's Carnival. What was what was it like doing that? It was so crazy and out there, it had to be fun. And how did they get that horn thing to stay out of the side of your head? The thing like the megaphone thing. Well, see, that's one of the big advantages of pretending to be Jesus as long yeah. as I have. I, I just made it grow out of my ear. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. You, you were yeah. great in that movie. I, I mean... So much fun. I, I made a mistake earlier, and I said you were the devil's publicist, and Tiffany's like, like, no, no, no he's no. always on God's side. He's always on Team that, God all, exactly all the time. Right. Did, you, did you like that film? Yes, yes it was it great. Was we, we loved both films, and, and wow. 
I mean, <laughs> that's a great part for well, you. Wait, wait, wait till you see the next one he's doing, okay? Oh, there's going to be a third one. I didn't know that. Well, well, it's, it, it's let me just say it'll be an element that um, will surprise everybody. Uh, because he he's a wonderful director, yes. and the creators of it are they're all they're all great people, you know. And um, he's broken through. Did you did you see any of the uh, uh, films? Uh, oh my God, yeah, my brain's fried. I'll have to come back to that. One. Uh, but he's made so many films that nobody knows about. Yeah, he did, well, he uh, did Saw. He did well the Saw films, okay, but he well, did Repo I, 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 and I, I, yeah. yeah. Repo the That's genetic right. opera would have been good for you too. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but 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 you know he made his career happen because of Saw. Right. Yeah. You know? uh, and the bottom line is they're putting together a, a new, shall we say, treatment, if you will, for another version of that concept. Mm. But you're not going to believe what he's doing with it, and uh, I I can't tell you anything more than that other than watch for it when the time comes. Well, and, uh, talk you. About it, I, I mean, you know, I, I just loved him, and it just kind of sucked me into the first one of, uh, you know, his type of film, because he had Paris Hilton, we had recently, we had interviewed her before that, but then he's casting people like Sarah Brightman, and he's casting people <laughs> like you <laughs> later on, I mean, he gets great people, <laughs> knows what he's doing. I, I, we're holding you over, and I, I got to get this in, because your business partner will kill me if I don't. <laughs> You know, Universal Studios, they're a great studio. Love them. I mean, classic movies and everything, and I've been there, worked many times. But they made two mistakes in their career. The first mistake was tearing down the amphitheater for Harry Potter World. <laughs> and the second yeah. one was, like, I could never figure out why they didn't put extras on the Blu-ray of Jesus Christ Superstar. And, and according to what we hear from your partner, you guys had some extra material that you tried to get them to put on the DVD, and then you wound up putting it out yourself, right? That's right. What's the story it's there? Called, it's called Superstars, and uh, it's the making of and the reunion of the cast and the director and whatever of Jesus Christ Superstar. Wow. Because uh, there was so much footage, so much magnificent footage that didn't make the film, and there were also people that are covering it for the media uh, while we were shooting. Hmm. Yeah, we, we, we were amazed as actors who'd never been in a film before yeah. that they were there all the time shooting for this one in Italy and that one in, in Segovia and then this one in Mexico and South America, you know, shooting, watching us get ready for the scenes and all that. So we were able to talk to some of them and say, could, could you please give us a copy, blah, 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 blah. Sure. And there's some of the most wonderful things, one of which is a brilliant interview with Norman Jewison wow. in which he was asked that question why a black man playing Judas right so we put all of those things we had together and we then put together that we, we had a reunion in New York a few years back with, uh, in honor of Norman Jewison's work and um, we did a screening of the film as well at the same time and uh, so we shot that on film and Frank and I decided to put it out as a film called Superstars and uh, it's available at our website, of course. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> Ted yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what Frank would kill us if I didn't say that. Yes, so TedNeely.com. TedNeely.com. Yes. Put, it, put it down and write it on the wall. And, and not only can yes. you get Superstar as a DVD there, but you've got a whole store. I mean, you've got other stuff too, right? Oh, God, yes. And the one that I've been I'm pushing the most is my most current CD, which is called Rock Opera, yes, and that's by re that's by request. Honestly, there are songs on it that people for years ask me and or Yvonne and or Carl uh, to do. So they're on there on that particular. Uh, Yvonne and I sing "Up Where We Belong," and Carl and I sing "God's Gift to the World." And uh, there's several other things in there that that are principal for me because people always want me to do a, a Christmas album of favorite Christmas songs, Perfect. and I yeah. honestly felt. But I honestly felt, good Lord, I can't compete with all these magnificent artists who've done that for the last 45 years plus. So I put one song. People said, well, do you have a favorite Christmas song? And I said, yes. And that is Oh, oh Holy Night. night. So, you know, that was yeah. in my head just now. I was thinking that the best song is Oh, Holy Night. And you covered I that. Should have just, I, I should have said to you, what would you choose? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> because... And I decided to do a rock version of Oh Holy Night, with respect. Obviously, it's you right. know it's not Metallica. Right. If I were Metallica, I wouldn't. I'd be out in the 
in South America right now in front of 65,000 people. Well, I, I feel we have but, such but, a connection because, well, I, we had Irene Kerr on, and I understand she played Mary Magdalene one time. And, and yeah. then you did Up Where We Belong. We had Jennifer Warren's on who uh, did the original she version. She was in Hair. Yeah, and, yeah, and she yeah. was in Hair and yes. did the song with Joe Cocker, Up Where We Belong. And so Absolutely right. Such a, we're, we're connected, <laughs> Ted, in more ways than one. In more ways than one. No question. And I keep waiting for you to tell me that you've done Superstar several times. And you just don't want to admit it. <laughs> And like so I said, role did you play? I, I did play Jesus once, like I told you, but I wasn't wearing superstar. underwear. Superstar. So I got to know, like, it was so hot. I, I can't believe you wore underwear under those robes. Well, that's what underwear is for. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got to tell you that I'm very happy that I did because there were many times when things happened and, you know, uh, I certainly didn't want to flash the jewels, but if Norma hadn't have been careful, it would have happened. So. Right. I always had underwear. I, I've never gone out anywhere in my life without underwear on. Well, I'm well, glad you, you, know. you lived to survive to tell the story because, I mean, just a generation, of, of, not a generation gap, but a language barrier had had to be a problem. Because I, from what I heard, you almost got nails driven into your hands. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it hadn't been for the fact that, well, casting process was overwhelming for Norman obviously he cast all over America and, and Europe and blah 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 and then when we got to Israel he wanted to put really Israeli people in there as well so we had a cast of over 50 that came from American Canada to go there and then when we got there he uh, multiplied that by two yeah. but local people mo there's so many people in the film as principal priests and so on the dancers all that that are from the country mm -hmm. and it's most specifically when we do a uh, Hosanna, Hosanna. Mm -hmm. All those little children were Israeli kids, you right. know. But but they learned the song to sing the song. The little kids could sing that song. Yeah. You know, there's one beautiful moment at the end of that song when I'm sitting and I got a little boy, I pick him up, put him on my lap, you know. Well, that little boy is probably 53, 54 years old now. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. When you think when you think about it, because we shot it in 1972, you see, came out yeah. in 73. So, so there's so many language problems they had to have. Normally, it's a, it's a director and two, uh, uh, and the first and second assistant directors. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there were 15 assistant directors just to be able to say action and cut in wow. the language that the people would understand. You see, so so yes, it was a problem, but if we worked with it and everybody was open to make it happen and boy we made so many dear friends who were Israelis and Syrians and it was amazing. That's but if, if that's wonderful. true though, what were you thinking? It's like uh, the guy that they hired to crucify you on the cross in the film, he misunderstood and almost drove the nails in your hand and Norman yelled, no nails in the hand, yelled it out. What, did, did you realize well, what was going on? I didn't know. I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> still trying to be an actor. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I wasn't looking at my hand. I was looking at the sky. Well, that's that's a little too much method acting. I mean, seriously, that would. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Ted, you you have to you had to have done something right because there are a handful of directors who are so famous that they basically can hand pick based off of who they are fans of. And yes, uh, one yes. of those is, of course, Tarantino, who handpicked you oh. for Django Unchained. Oh, yeah. And yeah. you know why? You know why you wind up in uh, Hallelujah, the Devil's Carnival, and why you wind up into Django? It's because you're a pop culture icon. These are the kind of people, these kind of directors, they get to live out their fantasies by putting people they enjoyed when they were younger into their films now. And, and you're, you're one of those. Like I told you before, I, uh, I say to people all the time when they talk about my connection with Jesus, I just say, I, I'm not Jesus. I'm a screaming rock and roll drummer from Texas who's the luckiest person to be alive. Right. I have had such good fortune all of my career. I've had no training in anything. I learned to play drums because my band didn't have a drummer, so I picked up the drumsticks and started bashing away and blah, 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 blah. Right. My parents gave us the opportunity to sing. So I never went through the educational process. So everything that I have done has been by personal experience. 
no agents, no managers, blah, blah, any of that. You know, Frank Munoz, who is the person who represents me now, right. is a friend of mine that I met when he was 12 years old. <laughs> his, his mother brought him to see Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> wow. Wow. That is awesome. And, and we were talking to people after the show, and this nice lady kept, comes up with this little guy, and the little guy is holding the soundtrack from the film, like it's his prized possession. And she introduced me to Frank, and, and she said, I said, man, that's a, that's a nice album you got there, buddy. <laughs> and, and his mother said, you have no idea. He said, this was originally his older sister's album. Wow. When he heard it, the first time he heard it, he stole it from her and has never given it back. <laughs> and he, lets it, he said, he, he lets her use it, but it's his album. It's his album. And his mom asked you know, him, what are you going to be when you grow up? He's like, I'm going to be Ted Neely's business partner. <laughs> 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 it worked out well. It worked out it well. Worked out it worked out perfectly. The way it worked out with Frank was, you know, he was tenacious as a child as well, and, and he was looking for work, and they were helping him get jobs and so on and so forth, and he had a liking for, for concerts. Yeah. And, and he had a, his dad had a friend who was part of the stage manager's union, the IOTC, that does all these concerts, and uh, he, he asked his, his friend if he would kind of show Frank the ropes, and maybe he'd be interested. The guy did. They worked it out for Frank as a, as a teenager to join the IOTC, and he's been a member of the IOTC all of his life, and he's become one of the most successful guys there. Anytime there's a concert anywhere by anybody, they always call Frank to come and do his thing. In that process, Incredible. he was called once to be a helper stagehand with Metallica doing a concert in San Francisco. Wow. And he met, he met all of them. And he, you know, in his best way, he let them know he was looking for a job. And the drummer hired him, Lars hired him to be his real boy. Wow. Taking care of his drum, packing, packing up the drum. He's been with Metallica now over 25 years. That's incredible. He's in South America right now on tour with him, you see. So, yeah. and, and whenever, the reason that we got together to do what we're doing is <clears throat> when we did one of our tours, uh, we opened it in uh, Hollywood uh, at the Huntington Hartford Theater. Uh, as a benefit to raise money for a children's youth theater up in, San, in, San, in uh, Santa Barbara. And we had done it in 1976 in the, the County, County Bowl in Santa Barbara to raise the first money for them to start it. Mm -hmm. The junior high school teacher started it, and he called Carl and I and said, could you do it? So we did. And it was wonderful. So then this was when we did, I think this was in, what, maybe 90, 80, somewhere late, late 80, early 90. We were doing a new one, so he asked us if we would do another one, and I, I said, yeah, but let's do it in Hollywood. So we did it at Donning Park and Theater. Right. Well, <clears throat> and while, while we're rehearsing, turns out, Frank was there doing some promotional stuff for Metallica. He's uh -huh. driving down Sunset Boulevard, or Hollywood Boulevard, excuse me, and he dances over and sees the marquee of the Hartford Theater, and he says, Jesus Christ Superstar. He, he said, I almost made a U-turn right in the middle of the boulevard, but he said, I went around the block, <laughs> came back, and then he saw on the marquee, our names were there, you see. So he bought tickets and came to see the show. And he came backstage after the show and he said, man, I met you when I was a kid. Frank Moon was my name. And uh, I got to I gotta work with you somehow. I, we, can we do something together? Right. So we, we've kept in touch and whenever there was a moment that I could actually use somebody with that kind of touring experience, I called him. And we've been now, into, we're entering our sixth year of doing screenings That's all over awesome. America. You're going to That's do more sure. too, right? I mean, there's more coming up. Oh, heck, 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 yes. We we were only gonna, we did it just to see if it would work. Yeah. Because I had been trying to get this, it, it set up to do screenings in movie theaters myself, and not not having a company do it, just go do it myself for years. And all the theaters would say, "Well, yeah, we love it, but you know, it's really old. I don't know if there's an audience out there." Well, I kept testing and testing and testing, and finally, one day, I'm sitting talking with Frank, and I said, "Man." I just, I got to do this stuff as a screening tour. I want to screen the movie, you know, just be in person and talk to people and do my regular thing, but screen the movie and they can all sing along. Yeah. You know? he, said, he said, man, that's a great idea. And he said, you, any theaters that you're aware of that would be interested? I said, well, they're all, I talked to them and they're all interested, but they think it's not going to work. He said, you know what? He said, I was just at the Chinese theater two weeks ago because Frank is a big fan of horror films. Yeah, oh, and there great. Was some kind of a, it was some kind of a horror film festival that happened there, and he, at that process, he met the uh, managers of the theater. He said, so let me give him a call, and see what it worked. Said, Great, he called them. Turns out the management, they're huge fans of Superstar, so our first ever screening sing-along was at 
the Chinese theater in Hollywood. Perfect. Nice. Perfect. So now when all of these theaters that I had called over the years read that, they went, oh, oh. well, let's get it too. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and you know, when you guys were so successful, uh, Frank got a phone call from John Legend. And John Legend was, come on over and work for me because I'm Jesus and Jesus Christ. Hey, and Frank was like, no, I'm working with the original. I'm working with Ted Neely. He's the, the OG. He's the real, he's the OG, original God, if you will. He is the man. So I, I do have to ask you before we end this, uh, what did you think? Did you see the John Legend uh, live event? Honestly, I have not yet seen it. I connected with him whenever they were rehearsing. I had heard about it, and I wished him all the best because yeah. I think he's a wonderful singer. Yeah. And I, it's recorded, but I had not had the time to sit down and watch it. I, I want to, but I'm not going to do it until I can really get in there and make it happen. Right. But I heard it was really good. It, it, well, my favorite thing was Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper was in it, and we we met Alice. Well, he, and, he played King Herod. Yeah, and and yeah, I know. He and, just and had I, so I much thought, fun with it. Well, you can, I can imagine what Alice would do with that. Character. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to ask you one silly question before we go. Heaven forbid anything ever ever come soon, but when that day comes that that you go you know upstairs because we know you will. Okay, because you kind of got it in there. Mm -hmm. You're standing before Jesus. What will you say to him when he says to you, okay, Ted, what do you have to say to me? I don't know how to love you. Yeah. And hopefully he'll laugh. Yeah. Hopefully he'll put his arms around me and say, bless you. You did a good go. job. Perfect answer. Perfect answer. Uh, we got to well, talk about the website yes. and the Facebook page. Well, once again, in case people didn't hear, it's tednealy.com. Did you know it was tednealy.com? It's tednealy.com. Tednealy.com. And yes. it's, it's what? Ted Neely on Facebook, yes. right? Yes, yeah. yes. But I, <laughs> we want to remind our listeners to make sure to check out Ted's website and head over there and get uh, the DVD of Superstars. Head over there and get the album, Rock Opera. Um, you can go over there and get some autographed 8x10s, all that fun stuff. I actually need to be visiting your website and buying some stuff, Ted, because Terry's birthday is on September 20, 20, or I'm sorry, 10th, and mine's on the 21st, which is the day after yours. So oh I have to be going buying some stuff. <laughs> this is remarkable. I, I, we we're both September. He's, all three of us are Ted's September. A Vir Ted's He's, a Virgo. Yeah, Terry's is September 10th, mine's the 21st, wow. and yours is the 20th. So we're all all September babies. There is so many connections we, here. It's incredible. We are family. That's right. And you know, we're so happy to get you on because we, we were trying, and you were on tour then uh, over yeah. in, in some country. And are you going to be doing that again? Aren't you going out to another tour or something? Or Yes. Yes, we are. Uh, and I have to, I'm saying yes, we are because when we first started in Rome, it was planned for six weeks of re excuse me, four weeks of rehearsal and a six week run, and that was in 2014. Right. We right. just ended our sixth year, and we're welcomed back to every country we've been to, and now they're asking us to come to countries in South America and all over the Middle East, and I, I'm a, the people react to it like it's the first time they've ever seen it, but they've all seen it many times, and they. I wish you could be there whenever we get together after the show and talk to people. I wish you could be there to see how they react in a performance. And you know, you get standing ovations. I in know, the show, definitely. The show, my God, it's awesome. I, the Sorry. incredible response. I was going to say you got to have the best, most understanding wife in the world, because women adore you, and it's not always in a religious way. I mean, there's women that you can just tell. I've even seen cute little Italian twenty-three-year-old reporters talking to you and you're very smooth and, and she was just falling all over Dying. herself and she had little hearts above her head and little cupids and stuff like, like it doesn't matter how old you get ted you're smooth and, and your wife has got to be so under, so understanding well i gotta say you use the word smooth i, I have to tell you many many times i have said to people um Cause you're so smooth. <laughs> Remember that song? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Just like the ocean. And believe it or not, what happens when folks? I can see that going on. You know, I always embrace them. Yeah. I always just pull my arms around them, and we embrace. Right. And and I can't possibly even consider anything other than that. 
because the reason they are there is they connect me so strongly with the essence of Jesus because of the character and the way this show is written and put together and certainly the way this production has been put together. There's no way under the sun that that I would do anything other than embrace them and welcome them back to see us again. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to say get a job because you've had a job for 46 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> can you believe that? Can you believe it? I, you know, it's, it's amazing when you think, well, I've had a job for quite a while. Or, yeah. or we jump to jobs, but I've been working in the same show. Yeah. And I still can't believe people still accept me in the role. I mean, I will admit to I'm 33, and I understand <laughs> that. But, uh, come on. <laughs> Uh, I'm honored. I could not be more honored. And and every time I get to do a production, I make so many wonderful friends in the cast and the crew and the band and the production team and all that. And oh my God! All, just, all these young kids that you work with is incredible. Because Tiffany was noticing last night that you were going up to the stage and and some lady was giving you a gift. It was a stuffed animal, and you were bending over, which can be dangerous. You know, it, certainly you again, know again tripping on the robe. It can happen. And the other cast, <laughs> they they were watching you. They were making sure that nothing happened. That you know, oh, yeah. you didn't trip on your robe or something, <laughs> and and, and they, they really protect you. Yes, they are. They are all so wonderful. And they could all be my children and some my grandchildren, you know. <laughs> but the respect is just unbelievable. And it's it's such an experience for me because it gives me new life every yeah. time I get to go on that stage. And I hope, oh, how I hope, that uh, we could do at least one more American tour before all this is said and done. Yes. Yeah, that's um, the only way I can well, see Well, you know, you Ted, have. you know, the 50th is coming up. I think there should be a big American tour for the 50th. Well, I must tell you that Andrew has already got that one happening. Um, he's been working on it for quite some time. Okay. Did you ever uh, meet Andrew Lloyd Webber? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, first, first, first met Andrew and Tim uh, when we were rehearsing for the Broadway show. Yeah, and then they were on the, on the set in Israel as well. And Tim... All this time that I've been in Europe, Tim comes to see the show constantly. <laughs> Andrew hasn't hasn't seen it yet, but Tim comes back. Tim is Tim is one of those guys who openly when he sees me, he'll go yeehaw. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to tednealy.com. We're gonna order superstars. Yes. We're, we're gonna buy some of the other stuff. Rock opera. Okay. We're gonna get that too. We're we're gonna see more of your European tour. Yes. We're gonna buy a house from your son. Yes. Uh, and we're, we're going to tear down Harry Potter World, rebuild the Universal Amphitheater, and have the 50th anniversary show in Los Angeles. I like it. That's a good plan. Oh, okay. Can I, can I add just, just one more thing? Of course. Sure. One more thing. And that is this. Frank and I, because we've been doing all this advertisement for so, for so long, and especially these past two weeks with this anniversary, uh, we found out there's so many people in America and around the world, but definitely in America, who keep saying... When are you coming to our town with your screenings? When are yeah. you coming? Well, we've set up a new venue now. It's called Superstar Live Screening by Request. Perfect. And okay. if you go there, because well, our, our idea is, is if the people want us to come to whatever city they live in, all they got to do is go there and say, this theater, this blah, blah, blah. And we take care of all the business. So, so what they need to do is to get their theater owners in their town interested in booking you and going to your website and start the conversation, right? If they can do that, yes. But if they can't, all they got to do is let us know the name of the theater in their town, uh -huh. and we'll contact those people. Oh, good. Yeah. Perfect. Because the first, the first one we did, and you know, like I said, was at the Chinese theater. Well, almost every one that we've done since has been people calling Frank or me, saying, hey, uh, Chinese theater, blah, 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 can you come to our town? Blah. Well, the first one that we're doing next isn't in still until next Easter time. Mm -hmm. And that's in a theater where we've been already five times doing this screening. And it's in in Ohio. Ohio, okay. Ye Yellow Springs, Ohio. And it's a small town. It's not as small as my hometown, but it's a lovely small town. Yeah. And it is absolutely magnificent. And we've done it many, many times. And they're so generous that when we go to that area, we always try to do a tour in the other cities and other states. They volunteer and come along and become part of our crew and our production team. Oh, that's great. Do you, do you still do uh, the fan experience? Oh, always. Yeah. We do We do a, 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 what they call a VIP before the yeah. screening. And then, then after the screening, I stay and talk to people. And like, for example, in, in, in Rome, 
there have been times after the performances that I'm still there at sunrise in the morning talking to wow. people. Wow. Who wa- and, and it's not because I'm generous, it's because I am, I don't even, I lose complete track of the time because the people are so wonderful and they tell me their stories and how this connects with their lives. And I, again, I'm the luckiest man in the world. And w- to be with you two, you guys are incredible. You know so much. <laughs> it, it was like sitting and talking to my family. Well, know? we're we're going to be like Ted Neely. We're going to do this till we drop. Yeah. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> and, and that's the way you need to do it. That's the way you need All to right, do so, it. So the, so the bottom line here is we will play somewhere in the L.A. area. The, Perfect. The sing-along screenings. And mm-hmm. believe me, you guys, please, you got to come as our guest and yeah. hang with us. With gotta Mike and there. myself and, and sing along in the... You know, you can wear the robe and you don't have to worry about underwear if that's how you feel that. Yes, yes. I, I was going to say that. I was going to say I will be checking to see if you're wearing underwear or not, but that didn't sound right. So I didn't. <laughs> uh, uh, well, Ted, so we do, we do this, this sing along and we also do costume contests. People come dressed as their there favorite you go. characters. So. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Well, Ted, I want to thank you. I can't you. tell you how much this means to me that you guys took this time out of your day and you have such a positive energy about it. And I love you both. And I hope we can see each other face to face soon. Have some lunch or something. I hope we can too. And um, all we can and say I promise, is. I, I, I promise I won't wear a beard and a, a wig. Okay? <laughs> okay. But you got to say yeehaw. Because... Yeehaw. <laughs> well, that's, that's how I start every meal. You know? <laughs> that's right. Well, Ted, I want to thank you so much, not only for joining us tonight, but also for your amazing work, for contributing to the legacy of Superstar, and for just the fact that you are so personable and share so much of yourself and your time with your fans. It is so apparent when you see you with any of your fans. It's just amazing. Oh, thank you, Stephanie. That's so sweet of you to say that. Bless your heart. I'll let you go back to your real life to where... You can sit around the home and, and your wife can tell you to take out the garbage because she'll be like, do you think you're Jesus? You have to work. I mean, you know. Uh, well, she actually walked by me a few minutes ago with a sign that says, garbage day. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Wow. <laughs> Terry, I, I'm amazed at how much you know about this. It just thrills me to death. Man. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Ted, and hopefully we will get a chance to meet you at some point in person. And, and uh, thank you for spending so much time with us tonight. I'm sure that there's just oh. going to be a lot more happening uh, with Jesus Christ Superstar and again we remind our listeners go to the website check it out tednealy.com Ted thank you again so much my absolute pleasure take uh, care guys all right. okay. have a great rest of your weekend bye bye okay right, bye 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 <laughs>